Um, Teh Hvala is uh, uh, one of the organizers of the Red Dawn Festival uh, uh, some years back and this year as well. And um, uh, besides that, uh, she is also a fe feminist and queer writer. And uh, uh, in this occasion, uh, I wanted to uh, ask Thea something uh, about uh, the workshops of collective writings uh, that uh, she is uh, uh, doing occasionally, and uh, specifically related to uh, the, the last one, which was uh, uh, held uh, within the frames of the Grand Domestic Revolution project uh, in, Utrecht. in Utrecht, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, which was dealing with this uh, uh, like private sphere and the space of the home, uh, which is uh, generally, uh, which is like mostly uh, uh, left uh, uh, outside of this like uh, uh, grand political thinkings. Uh, so uh, Thea held the, the workshop uh, in other words, in other worlds uh, there, and uh, uh, maybe you can tell us something uh, about your work there and. Uh, uh, generally, like how, how do you work uh, uh, with people and how do you create this uh, uh, mm -hmm. situation of collective writing okay. and what is this for you mean? Okay, so um, first maybe an explanation. The, my contribution to the exhibition, the Grand Domestic Revolution and to the Futurist Writing School, which was part of it, lasted for a whole week, 12 people, um, was just a small part of the whole writing workshop. So my contribution was they needed someone to figure out a technique that would help the workshops to get going, to relax people. And because most of the people there were from visual arts and conceptual art, also um, theoreticians and art historians, and not so much people with writing background. So uh, the organizers were really afraid that uh, people would be uncomfortable uh, with writing because it's not their main medium. And the workshops I have been doing for the last, sporadically, for the last uh, five years, um, are, are really good for this, exactly for this, like to, to um, let's say, uh, kill the self-directed uh, prejudice that you cannot write, that you are not inspired, that you don't know what to write about, and blah, blah, blah. Like, it's a great technique um, to, to just sweep away all these hesitations that people have about writing, this respect, and also this um, aura and, and uh, authority of the author. It's really good at um, also kind of relativizing that. And uh, the principle well, is, is nothing new, like I didn't make it up. Um, uh, I just used like several games that were already I don't know even if they made them up, but some of them were definitely their idea, like surrealists, especially for like French surrealists, also I heard Serbian surrealists. Um, and because uh, they started with the idea that, um, that something had to be done to counter this um, very rational approach to writing and thinking where you always start from the a thesis and then you have to defend it or, or, or you know, contrary, like uh, dismiss it with uh, very structured argumentation and, f and just the whole like um, fictional narrative as a very rational narrative with uh, this Aristotelian triangle, you know, beginning, peak, ending, like, uh, and it all has to make sense, right? So they, they wanted to play with that structure and they figured out, like, I don't know, for sure, at least 100 games on the level of, of, of words, on the level of sentence, on the level of whole story, and so on. And uh, my favorite has always been the Exquisite Corpse, which I'm sure everyone knows from, like, as when you were a kid, from playing as kids, when you, like, you, you fold the paper like this. Uh, and then if it's four people, one starts writing here, and then third, you hide it, you give it to the other person, and they continue writing without seeing what you did before, or if they want, they can see it, but it's more fun if they don't know what you did. And mostly people play this um, with uh, drawing. And uh, with a group here in Ljubljana, was, uh, I said, like, let's try this in, in writing, you know. 
Uh, and especially because I also, like, when it came to my writing practice, I was not very self-confident in terms of, like, um, my style didn't seem like to really fit the, the canonical criteria, especially because I'm really into sci-fi, science fiction. And then when you add, uh, add feminist themes and like explicitly political content, you're immediately pushed into the, like, uh, the, the margin of the margin, the, the genre, like the most like genre that is not considered even seriously within like criticism. So we, we tried this game and it was great um, because uh, for, for all these reasons, like I said, it, it uh, dismissed all, all the hesitations about uh, us not being good writers or not having ideas and so on, because the technique itself forces you to write so fast that you cannot think a lot, and, and all this like hesitation just disappears. And people, when usually people, when they do this for the first time and they see what they wrote, they are like, I did this, you know? Some people get scared, especially like in feminist contexts. Um, there's, there's this tendency or this uh, expectation, self-expectation that if you're in a feminist or queer context or community, then um, you are expected to write like very affirmative narratives, you know, like uh, very politically correct narratives mm -hmm. also. And with this technique, this is impossible. Because, I mean, the surrealists claimed also that the, the subconscious is at work here, really. I, I think that's quite true, because you have actually no control over the narrative, because you, you just have to write so fast you can't really think what you're doing. I know it sounds like a paradox, but there, there is a point there for sure. But how then do you introduce this feminist politics in, into this? Well, I, tr I, I start, usually I start uh, just by introducing um, uh, like describing maybe like the most groundbreaking uh, novels, uh, sci-fi novels or short stories, uh, which were like the first groundbreaking in the sense that they were the first very direct feminist interventions into the genre of science fiction, which was very macho and very like, I don't know, I mean, you know, basically men, men dominated as many other fields of art. And this, like, in the end of the 60s, especially in the States, United States, uh, some authors like John Ross and uh, James Tiptree Jr., um, or Alice Sheldon, and uh, also Ursula Le Guin and later Octavia Butler and so on, they really, like, changed the genre completely because all of a sudden, um, next to discussing technical innovation, which was always the focus, and like space exploration and going outwards, you know, this, this drive to, to, to colonize and dominate new worlds and, and subjugate them, all of a sudden the interest moved to, to like very specific differences, like, or, or more to culture, social structures, alternative social structures, alternative gender orders. Or, or arrangements and so on. And so I just take a few examples and like analyze them so to see the, 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 the change in the, in the sense of the content and the form. And then uh, uh, depending on the people, we talk about it and then you, I already see like, you know, what's sort of the interest. And then we play some very short games really for relaxing where you kind of see in the end uh, which themes keep popping up and then usually we take one of those things that keeps coming up in the group, because it really depends on the group, and we develop it into a longer narrative, like a short story format. Or in Utrecht, it, uh, the, the case was novel form. Very great expectation on the side of the organizers. <laughs> and uh, it's still like in the process, we're still editing it. But uh, it was interesting because it was part of a like two-year project which included a, a exhibition, a residency center, and this last writing workshop, and the theme, the title is The Grand Domestic Revolution, and um, they discussed like several aspects of the private-public divide, not only like unpaid uh, reproductive work versus paid productive work, but also public space versus private space, uh, commons versus private property, like all these aspects. 
uh, and and they did it like in various ways from community gardening to like making home uh, honey schnapps to I don't know really like to videos and and this narrative that we've been asked to produce like these 12 uh, contributors um, is is going to be included in the catalog which is I don't know when it's coming out and we're supposed to we were supposed to kind of conceptualize or just make a frame, like a futurist frame for all these little or big <laughs> as you want it, but for all these pieces that were produced during the exhibition, you know, like videos, architectural innovation, blah blah blah. So we, we kept linking the narrative, which was completely like sci-fi, to, to these actually existing social experiments from the past, from the present, and so on. So I think it's going to be quite interesting in the end. Mm. But uh, I, right now I have no idea, actually, like, how... Now it seems pretty messy still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, also it's really interesting in the sense of this, uh, like, collectivity, like how uh, uh, this thing, which is uh, considered mainly to be, like, author-based, uh, like, writing, yeah, yeah. Uh, all of a sudden becomes uh, something uh, like a group of people share. And uh, I mean, I'm really interested how this like the dynamic works and the, the, the things relating to like, uh, I mean, this mutual work and communication yeah. and uh, contributions and uh, also like, mm. I don't know, maybe issues of the authorship as well. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I mean, like usually, um, let's say if there's like up to six people or, or even let's say up to nine people, I don't know. Um, or anyway, no, no matter how many people, the first reaction is always really liberatory. Mm -hmm. Just because the techniques work so fine. But then when you start editing and you have to connect the pieces together that, so that at least they make sense within the narrative, not necessarily outside the narrative. Mm -hmm. Uh, then, um, of course, it gets more complicated because you have to really like show your willingness to listen to other people and to take into consideration what they did, not only what you did. And also you have to be willing to delete stuff you have written and rewrite it and so on. So there's a lot of negotiation. And this, uh, I think, is, is the difficult part. Uh, again, depending on the group, with small groups it's, it's much easier, but like this case, let's say with 12 people, we were, we were three people moderating, and we had very different approaches to moderation, so um, it actually worked out surprisingly well, except that some people who um, had no prior writing experience or little experience and, and had this liberating moment, I can do it, you know, maybe got too enthusiastic about their own skill and really wanted to keep their little piece visibly theirs, you know. Like not merge into the whole, but they wanted to, the personal stamp to be visible. And this was a bit hard to negotiate then because the point is the opposite in a way, you know. That, that, that you, you, you find the points of, of, of connection where the narrative flows in a way that you, you don't see the difference between different writers. I mean, not necessarily, but... And, uh, I, I mean, I never insist on consistency because, I mean, it's an experiment and sometimes you get more interesting synchronicities if there is no, like, direct, you know, or, or linear, like, why, that's why, you know, or logical narrative. But still, like in this case, um, we were asked to, to of course, because you're not writing for yourself, right? You're writing for other people, so you have to have in mind the reader who wasn't part of it, and you have to make it accessible enough so that people can actually understand it. And this was a bit problem within the group to, to um, just the editing process.